Welcome to Raise Them Rugged, the podcast for parents wishing to raise confident, adventurous, anti-fragile children who are ready to take on life's challenges. Let's get started. Lucas Ritson in Australia. Whereabouts in Australia? I didn't ask that just before when we were chatting. Um, from the Gold Coast. And that is on the west side? East. East, East Coast. Perth. Um, just East, near. East. Right. Perth East, is west Brisbane. and Melbourne, Brisbane, everything over on the yeah. east. I get, I get confused yeah. that way. Yeah. So we're, we're now south of Brisbane. Okay. And with Worthy. Worthy, yep. Yeah. You do playground, natural playground. Yeah talking getting kids playing getting kids exploring i've been around yeah. on on your website and seen some of the the cool things you're doing the imaginasium yeah it's good fun yeah absolutely so tell Taking me a bit a place about them. tell me a bit about yourself your background and uh your business and all the all the sort of things that you do so where to start this mm. long complex story um no uh i s- in my realm, my delving into the play realm actually started after working and studying permaculture. So I was consultant doing rooftop gardens for hotels, um, community gardens um, for community groups and government and um, workshops at community farms on beginner gardening and beginner permaculture. I just called it beginner gardening because beginner permaculture is a bit too intimidating. Mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. And then I was doing that and I really had a heart for wanting future generations to understand where their food comes from. I grew up in hospitality. I've worked as a chef in my younger days. So I've always loved food and growing food. And then about, I just saw it as a great vessel to set up. The reason for the why before that, I actually spent seven years in the Middle East working for Emirates Airlines, a lot of flying around, just a bit of a transient lifestyle. Great, amazing, like travel, seeing the world and everything. But then it was just a point I met my wife over there and I just wanted to do something that contributed. Going to places like India, Kenya, Tunisia, you name it, like across the world and seeing just such a divide. And one thing that really stood out for me was the children in in those cultures. Like I went to jump over a divide one time in, I don't know what African country it was, but I went over to jump over a divide in the middle of a road as I was crossing the road. And um, there was actually children sleeping in the middle divider in the garden in the middle of the road. And stuff like that has just always stood out to me so much. And it's really hit me hard. And then just by chance and how it works and just wanting to do something i wanted to work with kids to understand the environment and understand where their food comes from and hopefully be able to take that into adulthood i came across a job working in early childhood as an educator and there was a special role and it was like back in the days of the newspaper so you know how old i am right looking for a job in a newspaper and then from there i got a job and the outdoor educator role was your your classroom for early childhood centre is completely outdoors. You work with from everyone from, from babies all the way through to the kindy program. And because I had this gardening background, they were like, sweet. What I didn't anticipate was the level of play right. going on because I was just like, okay, I'm going to teach them gardening and we're going to do some cool stuff. But then I started to really be interested in the play piece because I would use play to get their attention. I was trying to make these classes playful because that worked best. And then getting my geek on around understanding play and other practices and looking at like junkyard playgrounds in Scotland and forest schools in Norway and um, just looking at research. I've got a tendency of once I find something I'm really passionate about, I, um, get a bit hyper-focused on it. So, yeah, the permaculture world met the play world and we very much co-created the environment where I worked with the children. So within a few months, we had fire pits in the playgrounds. We were harvesting trees that were getting trimmed and building our own additions to the forts in the playground. We were flooding areas with rainwater to make big mud pits, saws and hammers, everything. So... It gained a bit of interest and more people were starting to talk to me about, hey, how how do you get away with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) 
And um, from there, people were coming to check out what I was doing. And they would say, oh, can you come look at our centre? That jumped into going out looking at their centres. And then I'd just draw pictures and say, oh, you could do this. This would be really good and um, work for you, minimum outlay. Because And then they're like, oh, so great. We've got a playground company coming in and they're going to do a Renault on our play environment. It's going to be great. And I was like, that's so cool. Brilliant. And then I go back in, they call me out again to get me to tell them how they use their playground. And this, the cool areas they had of these little imprints where the children were hidden away and the most valuable spots were like ripped out, token garden placed in, astroturf, yeah. fort. And I was just like, what are they like? That makes no sense to me. They removed the all the creativity. So limiting all the creativity got the agency. Like, okay, okay, your children had a bit of freedom before. Now they got squat. Yeah. And then at this time, I'd met a training company and he was flying me around, getting me to talk on these this approach, looking at the sustainable development model of development, developing your space from a in not just environmental, but social standpoint and economic standpoint so yeah i was going around talking about that and risky play and then so many people are i was just getting more frustrated and the guy that's the training company he's like don't you have the guys that work for you that do the community gardens because i was the the community garden thing and creating edible landscapes for people was still going right so you had that as a business at this well, time <laughs> yeah right so there was uh, some days i'd go to start the guys at a property yeah. Go to work, leave on my break, go there, finish, come back to work, go there in the afternoon, do it on weekends and stuff. Yeah. And this guy's like, don't you have carpenters and stuff that are doing this? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, why don't, why don't you, you just, just build, build the playgrounds? playgrounds? And I was like, fine. Yeah. Will. Yeah. And then I went to understand the standards and, and all of that stuff. And it was in an era where we were at a stage in Queensland where I am where they were like, oh, can we put a log in the playground? Now there's heaps of logs in playgrounds. It's like 10 years on. But at that time, it was kind of like moving from that astroturf and mm -hmm. rubber. Mm -hmm. There was still a rubber playgrounds going on back then. So moving from that into the more nature-based stuff. And then we just started building them. I ended up leaving my educator job, doing public speaking and um, building playgrounds and doing all the landscaping myself um, with, with the carpentry team. Love and it. here we are. Now we've Love got archi landscape architects and multiple teams and all of that. So very, very fortunate to be on such a cool journey where I get to build fun stuff. Yeah, and it's a cool, a cool progression. When I was on your website and reading over your bio and saw that the the initial business was a um, you know edible landscapes, organic landscaping, mm. and Right away, I said, uh, it doesn't say permaculture, but being from Australia uh, with uh, Bill Mollison's yeah. ghost ever present, I'm sure that it had permaculture yeah. at its roots. So, and 100%. then to, to evolve out of um, permaculture was really interesting. Like I said, that's sort of my route in, in landscape design as well is the first time I was really designing landscapes and spaces was I had a full semester permaculture course and we had a design, mm -hmm. you know, and we moved out to our little farm space and I designed a lot of the general zones and layouts around permaculture principles. Right. So it's really interesting to be able to chat with yeah. you. You have sort of that it, it's for me here in Canada, Ontario, it's a little more rare to come across someone who has that as what, what started things, you know, mm -hmm. and progress from there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah, the playground side and the, you know, bringing in sort of the, the risk, the natural elements, what do you see, yeah. you know, so your typical playground, rubber, monkey bar, slides, some of them are cool, they look cool, yeah. but I yeah. guess they're very prescriptive for the children, this is what you do mm -hmm. in these spots, so when you, you build the things you're building, and you, if you could see children interacting in a conventional playground versus one of yours, what what's the main difference you see or like that I would see if I could see that happening side by side? So we like to be the bridge. We I talked to the team about being the bridge between wilderness and rugged, <laughs> ruggedness mm -hmm. to steal, steal your phrase there. And because just parents aren't getting outdoors. So if I was to go in and build a completely rugged playground, like 
it might as well be Mars to so many families. So okay. sometimes I will have a few of those elements that act as that familiarity. But what you'll see in the playground is we really put an emphasis, emphasis, if you will, on the child having the agency to put their imprint on the space. So there's spaces that are theirs. I want to be able to walk into one of our environments and see evidence that children have been there, the evidence that children have made it their own. Mm. I want to see the desire lines in the gardens. I want to see where their points of interest are, where they can have these little nooks away from everything. Because when it comes like the parallels between permaculture and ecology from a nature-based standpoint and play are all, all very intertwined. When you're looking at children from an ecological model, the traditional parks that you mentioned there and playgrounds, they're consumers when we're talking ecological terms. Mm -hmm. They're just consuming, consuming, consuming. It's like, hey, entertain me. What's next? I'm going to eat it up, spit it out. It's very limiting. But when you create a robust environment, they can become, become the providers or producers in those ecological terms. They're leaving little provocations or little cues for other children to investigate. It's their imprint and little tracks on the space that give that indication for another child to explore. They're providing to the environment. And that's where that whole social, the importance of social first comes in for me. Looking at the sustainable development model as earlier, uh, when I spoke in Finland, I did a talk called You Can't Have Environmental Sustainability with an Environmental Practice. I got a few crossed arms when I said that, but mm. it's one of engagement, one of fulfilment, one of accomplishment, well immersed in nature prompts the innate response to care for the thing that cares for us. Why are you going to go out and have environmental practices and compost and be interested in permaculture and creating ecosystems if you don't even have a relationship for that thing? The difference would be, in short, social first yeah. with the child at the centre. So as far as the kids having imprint then, so you're designing spaces then where it's not static. It's like this is this thing and this is what you do with it. So how... What type of things do you actually put into these or build into these playgrounds? So what I'm picturing when you're talking there is that if I showed up at one of your playgrounds one week and I came there two weeks later, certain things of it won't look the same anymore. Is that correct? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah, we use, we use a lot of loose parts play. Mm -hmm. So r random objects that are flexible, changeable, mix of everyday items. Um, and I say our playgrounds are just the base. For the children to build on top of like yes they can look pretty and amazing and like yeah you know, oh wow that's nice but without that imprint of the child laid in with those flexible pieces it might as well just be a regular park down the road i get it yeah and and if you're looking for your listeners when you assess the quality of play look for the level of imprint on a space that a child can make and that will indicate how much they value the space. Right. We, we know this innately. We gravitated to the, the places beyond the park growing up. Yeah. Like that little bushland next to the park. We wanted to be in there because we could have our imprint. We could have ownership. It was flexible. It was changeable. There was a certain level of wonderment to it. It was like, well, no fort, no play structure is can compete with nature and what nature can do at yeah, all yeah yeah it's magic like practically yeah so the playground is almost like it becomes its own entity that's sort yeah. of um evolving and discovering itself through the imaginations and and actions of the of the children that use it yeah right so it sort of becomes yeah. like a, an actor in the same play almost yeah and in, environment creates behavior Right. Like, and you can be very strategic. I have an ecology of play model based on research from, okay, where are we going to allow, where can we support this behavior? So we create the environment that supports the behavior and exploration that we want for the children, like playing at height um, for that emotional regulation. So looking at these different spaces where then they can thrive. And then, of course, children are getting hurt all the time in your playgrounds way more than anywhere else. And parents freak out. 
Because that's, um, that's your intention, right? Is obviously to make sure that kids get hurt. Yeah. Well, we create risk, um, not hazard. So a risk as a defined term that I like to use, it's an easy one, is risk is anything that's risk can be suitable for the purpose impossible to negotiate that's it a hazard the difference between isn't... risk and danger or risk and hazard right yeah yeah and, and then hazard is something that is inherently dangerous that will cause an injury almost for sure it'll cause injury if yeah. given enough time and enough uh, interaction exactly so right. an example of a hazard would be if you've got a classic like the a-frame set up things with the climbing boards like we've seen that before million everyone can relate to that one you know is it can the child slip and hit the frame, the plank, the ground. Yeah, absolutely. But is it suitable for the purpose? Yeah, because that's what they're doing. Is it possible for them to negotiate? Yeah, absolutely. So I deem that a risk. Mm -hmm. Now, if those same equipment was like set up on concrete or there was um, a broken plank, sharp steel, unbalanced equipment, like that's the stuff I'm going to jump in and say, hey, I don't care about your development. We've got to fix this. From a playwork standpoint, I love their definition of hazard, which we layer in as well, is that a hazard is anything that the child doesn't see that can cause them injury. So right. with, with that with that mindset, they say, no, like a risk is if a child can see it, touch it, feel it, they mm -hmm. know it's there so mm -hmm. they can manage it. So that's why fire, like we innately know not to touch fire because it gives us such a sensory feedback. Yeah. But the things are going to cause us injury, the sharp bit of wood sticking out of the ground as I'm running through, you know. Yes, I, yes. I don't, I don't see. Something you don't so. see, right, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. broken. A piece of glass buried in the lawn, glass, right. Nails sticking yeah. out, splinters. Yeah. Um, also, when being nature-based as you and your boys are, when they're climbing a tree, the hazard isn't falling out of the tree. They know they've had mm -hmm. to fight gravity to get up there. Mm -hmm. The hazard is the small, the rotted branch that they don't see, the small branch. And we've become these like guardians of or the authority, of the old careful, 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 careful. Like, hey, it doesn't help. No. Don't like give them the information they need to make an informed decision for themselves. Yeah, I like that. And I've heard of the idea of not using the word be careful. I've tried to avoid yeah. it with my kids. Be careful. Well, it doesn't mean yeah. anything. Give them some no. guidance. Yeah. And, and, and you know, look at the simple model of Maslow's, which has been challenged. I know it's not the perfect model, but if we come back to, okay, are, are they feeling that safe and security first? So instead of be careful, start there. Hey, I'm here if you need me. Yeah, and yeah. then when you when they're safe and they're exploring, they're moving up that and they're moving into that decision making and accomplishment zone, self fulfillment mode. It's like, okay, how are you going to get there? Hey, what's your plan? Yeah, that's right. So you're handing yeah. the agency back to them, yeah. and we don't want to. Every time we say be careful, also from that, like from the physiological standpoint, when we have accomplishment, your boys are up the tree. They're getting their dopamine, every little goal they set and achieve. That's right. They're yeah. coming from this dopamine model. And it's awesome because when adrenaline starts to creep in, they're uncertain. Their brain goes, well, it felt good last time. So it actually pushes them. The dopamine is going, hey, let's push past this adrenaline and this uncertainty. And then once they push past that adrenaline, they actually get a bigger dump of dopamine. So it pushes it up, which then inspires them. So you imagine- to keep going a through a child's limits here. Yep. And once they challenge it, it actually jumps. Yeah. But then this adrenaline has to come all the way and jump again. So but that, so that's that um, self-risk assessment, challenge promoting, that accomplishment, that self-fulfillment and agency. Like you did this by yourself. That's that's how you get resilience. Hey. Yeah. So you see a difference. Children that, that are sort of guided along that way versus bubble wrapped. I keep referring to this in almost every interview I do about reading Jonathan Haidt, Coddling of the American mm -hmm. Mind. And he sort of maps out what may be the results of a generation of helicoptering and bubble wrapping, which is a lot of stuff we're yeah. seeing in the universities now. Kids that are yeah. triggered and need safe spaces and think speech is harm and all this sort of stuff. And he links it to... Yeah. potentially what what it sounds like you and i are in a way trying to fight against if we mm. i can say another way raise them rugged can be a way to raise kids that don't need safe spaces you know yeah. it's not only about that physical resilience 
But I think hand in hand and what you're getting to with the adrenaline, the dopamine, the self-confidence is that physical resilience is also building a mental resilience. And if you layer on some other techniques at home in your parenting that teach your Mm. children how to regulate themselves mentally, uh, I just I I have to think that the if you think of it from a purely uh, competitive standpoint, I'm a competitive person. I don't try to view everything Mm. as a competition, but you you tend to being an entrepreneur, you 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 can't. I you talked about laser focusing in. I just call it getting obsessed over things. You know, when you're in a rabbit hole of obsession on something, you can't let it go. And next thing, you're employing Mm. twenty people with your obsession. You know, so yeah. Um. So the idea of this, the competitive side of it, is like I'm competitive, but what what advantages do you think this is giving children to raise children in the type of thing you're talking about type of thing I'm talking about throughout their lifetime? Like, absolutely. Well, I think the default to think of raising your child rugged and raising your child resilient is like, get them out there, push them, expose them to all these challenging things. But it actually starts with a really caring, compassionate relationship first. And I think that's overlooked in like Mm. trying to raise rugged and resilient Mm. children because they're not going to explore, they're not going to gain independence if they're not feeling safe and secure first. So I think that relationship intention is is overlooked a lot of the time and, and not valued. So when it comes to a child having this more rugged, independent childhood that transitions into adulthood, they're not only taking that aspect and learning around getting out, being focused, being challenged, being competitive, they're actually taking with them the basis of these values and relationship that someone cares for me, that's here for me. There needs to be a very clear delineation in the term like this. It's not coming from a place of neglect no, and leaving them like, hey, just get outside, go in the bush you know, you're there with them. Like it's comes from a place of love, compassion and effort to get out there with your children and you're demonstrating those terms. So when your child's transitioning from that, that milestone to an adult, those are, it's, it's, I view it as care and compassion first. And they have that care and compassion, not only in relationships for themselves and a certain level of self-awareness and the physiology if we look at the physiology of the body and how we learn, that's how it works. You know, we're social beings. I love the Bromfrenbrenner, Yuri Bromfrenbrenner series around. It's the, he has that ecological model, but it's relationship in conjunction with environment. Right. And, and we know that, you know, that a lot of the time, the, the quality of a relationship in connection is determined by the environment right. the, in which that relationship takes place. You could sit on a screen and tell a child how to be resilient to the cows come home, but it's not until you have that conversation outdoors where they can actually have experience where they're absorbing it through their physiology. We know we learn through our senses, but then we're trying to teach these terms in an abstract way. Mm -hmm. So, oh, you need to have these feelings. Where where are your feelings? I can't touch it, feel it, taste it, especially for boys. Like we're very sensory learners. If I can break it down to understand it better, but we need to learn through our senses to develop, take that world in and absorb that learning that then is inside us that we take into adulthood. So I think in short, that rugged lifestyle makes a more rounded adult that doesn't crash when they are transitioning from a child to an adult. Would you rather, would you rather your child to learn and fail? when they can come back and hold your hand about it? Or would you prefer them to do that when they've got a ton and a half car that they're controlling? Yeah, or other other pressures as they, they get older and older, academic pressures, job pressures, 100%. whatever it may be. Like the exposure, it's like exposure therapy, which is known to be yes. the yep. best form of getting over any type of fear is gradual exposure to it. So in a way you're doing yep. you know, a, a decade or more length of exposure therapy on your child, you know, exposing them to some adversity so they know how to deal with it and get over it. So I think. Yeah, a hundred percent. And yeah, no, go ahead. Would you rather your child learn about these things relationally with you, where you can be a, you can be that person, their confidant, their, their bearing, Mm -hmm. you know, their true North, if you will, or 
the research says like they go through that learning young or we see it they'll go through those learnings around values and developing risk and hazard matrix they looked to peers yeah as teen as teenagers 14 for that to learning. 17 year old boys 14 yeah. to, you know where they go to look for and that they don't, yeah and they don't they're looking for their peers that equally have no concept of it as well not no but you know, they're struggling with the same challenges and mm-hmm. therefore, you know, all you need to do is look at like fail videos online, half of them are teenage boys. Yeah. <laughs> like I'll backflip off a roof into a garbage can. It's yes. going to work out well. Yeah, yeah. Um, no risk hazard analysis there. Yeah, or they take it somewhere worse, you know. 100, easily. Yeah, and if there's no rite of passage and significance, and, and we're talking about uh, developing identity, mm-hmm. aren't we? Like giving your child that agency to develop as an individual with certain freedoms and failures. And it's our job as parents to give our children, expose our children to the learning experiences that simulate the real world. Biggest injustice we can do for our children is to give them the impression that the world is easy. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's, it's, you know, we talk to our boys about that all the time, nonstop. Things are not easy. Nothing is easy. Everything is hard work. And they have to understand that. Maybe their life will end up being easy. We don't know. But if they're at least expecting it not to be, Mm. that'll be better. You know, the expectation Mm. that things are are given to you and things are, you know, and and things to challenge you, you don't have to deal with or walk away from. Right. And, you know, the idea too, like, I think when you, yeah, you think like a lot of it, when you're with also with your children, the idea of if you're going through an adverse situation along with them, and they're looking to you on mm. how you react, right? So it's also you you can be testing yourself while you're teaching this sort of thing to your kids, right? Or even if it's just that you one of your play spaces and playgrounds and a kid is getting themselves into a risky situation, which is there by design, it's how mm. their parent or their teacher supervisor, whoever is there reacts to it will mm. be how they now frame that situation and what it is to them, right? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And we, I see a lot of teachers and parents teach from that very polarizing language. It's right or it's wrong. You can or you can't. You're happy or you're sad. There's duality in all of it. You know, there can be a situation where there is right and wrong. You can achieve something and fail at the exact same time. It's for the only path to achievement, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I love this phrase that I'm hearing a bit more of is the bulldozer parent. Yeah, I think I've heard it. Go ahead and explain it though. Yeah. So we've evolved from the helicopter parent and bubble wrap parent to we're like, no, I let my children do what they want and give them independence. But the bulldozer parent goes in front of their child and knocks Mm. over all obstacles so they get a clear run at it. Clears everything out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Does their projects for them. Yeah. No, and, yeah. and it, it's it's real bad. You literally hear stories of um, parents phoning up university professors, demanding meetings with university professors who gave their kids a bad mark or a bad grade. Like this, yeah. you're not doing. Yeah, you're not doing any good to your children, or you think even if that, like, let's just say that that's the situation for I don't know what percent of children, but if that becomes a critical mass of children that mm. are being raised in that manner. What is that doing for all of society as these kids now become the ones who have to have to lead the world? Like, Mm -hmm. or will they even be able to, will it be the minority then who have had some sense of resilience in their life, rise up to be the leaders? Will there be a smaller percentage of people who actually are able to become leaders? I I start to think about where this all goes another 20 years out, 30 years out. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a real concern for, like, you look at the data around mental health of our teenagers oh, and young adults. It's atrocious. And it's it's just brutally sad amongst them. Uh, uh, that's the first word that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to point the finger at them or blame blame people for their situation. We've just got to accept it what it is. But then we've got an ethical responsibility to have these conversations and say, okay, well, what's the reasoning behind? What's like, really at the root of it? Yeah. What's the root of it? And what can we do, not for them, but once again, coming back to that acts of love, acts of kindness for one another 
Like, I think there's a certain amount of I want to create a really nice society for my children. So if I can impact as many children as possible, maybe I can contribute to that overprotective father, probably. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how old <laughs> but are your how, a, how old are your kids? And uh, uh, six and eight. So oh, close almost to your, exact same boys, girls. Um, Layla's eight, and Jules is six. Jules. Yeah. 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 So yeah. And you know that I can only only relate to my as a, as a father. I can only relate to these as is that father figure. But I've worked with thousands and thousands of children, you now directly or or indirectly, um, and you certainly see these common themes coming up. The types of things that inspire children. The types of things that they're really quite fearful about. And growing up as one of six boys outdoors a lot. Um, that was a thing that stood out for me as an educator was like, these kids seem scared to explore, right? to, f- to fail, even like to get the big one that stands out is like oh, getting dirty and getting wet. Right. I, was, I remember that moment. I see it so clearly of that, like, just, just kind of looking at these kids like, you're genuinely, you genuinely seem scared about this. Right. And I know there's all different developmental challenges with that. I'm not saying there's not, but it seems to be more and more the case, unfortunately. So when I get to, you mentioned being in in Finland, doing some talks there. Yes. And Mm. what that was about and then what you see, because I've I've heard and read a little bit about the the Finns education system. It sounds like there's some some differences there and what you what ahas you've seen or discovered and, and explain what, uh, you know, fundamental differences between the way they choose to educate. And I would think Australia, US, Canada are probably somewhat similar uh, education systems to a degree. Yeah. A big standout in Finland is the culture of education. And, you know, their their word for teacher has evolved over time, but the original word for teacher was the librarian in the village was a teacher. And the translation is the light of the village. So that comes back from generations and generations. And it's like they're bringing the light of wisdom in. Yeah. So yeah. Te- teachers are really respected. You have to have a minimum of a master's to be able to work in early childhood. So you've got these two things. You've got this culture of education, but then it's actually in action as well. There's three, there's three government, there's three governing parties that compete in Finland and they all prioritize education. No one right. cuts anything. Right. So a new party comes in, it's not a matter of like, well, I'm cutting this funding for this. Yeah. It, it's agreed upon. Yeah. And well, it's, it sums it up. Like I met the, sat down, got to talk to the education minister, now former education minister. And I was specifically referring to early years. I said, why do you put such a focus on education, like early years education? And he said, um, well, if they start behind, they stay behind. I was like, okay, what does that mean? And he says, very Finnish answer. We have, a, have an ethical responsibility because the research tells us that we have a responsibility early to set them up for success throughout their life. And we've only got one shot at that. So that's why. And that's just, that's a modeling for edu- that's a model modeling for their education centers. A lot of independence, a lot of agency, respect in the child as the learner, not a participant. Like <laughs> when you think of that, just a change in words, they're learning, they're not participating because it's just not, not long for the journey. And that that theming goes all the way through. If you go to a like a college, I think you'd have a college and then university over there. We have the same. They get the same amount of resources. Right. So you could, well, I walked into a building because we got to tour college, um, university, early childhood and schools while I was there. And I walk in, there's a huge simulator. And I was like, oh, like, is this like airplane simulation, like big thing. And they're like, no, this is a truck driving. It's a three-year course. Wow. Three-year course to be a truck driver. We go to another floor and it's all these different offices and like all these little themed things. That was where they were teaching cleaning. So you've got that on one side. And then we went to the business school in, um, we walked into this red brick building and it was like a startup lab walking into a co-working space and the way they start their business first day is they pull everyone together and said okay what businesses do you want to start wow and right from go, the oh, right from the go 
I was thinking of, I want to do a um, self, well, this is an actual one that was there. It was quite successful. Um, self-growing mushroom kits. Right. And they go, cool. Anyone else interested? You, you, you. Do okay. it. You guys are together. Wow. Who else? Oh, I, I want to do an um, organic skincare product. Anyone interested? Okay, go start. Um, so they do like mushroom guys. They sold cans of drink at the park in summer. They upgraded to the like ice cream cart to a food truck and they sold each one and progressed on. So it was like this big journey to actually get this themselves funding and um, also trying to go out and get seed funding as well as doing these other strategies to get there. And that's their university. Their, their lecturers have like a little side room in the startup lab where they just go knock on the door. Hey, I've got a question. What, how, how can I do this? And they're like, okay, well, I'll give you some advice. There was actually a, a startup company getting sued by the local government while we were there because they breached their contracts. Okay. Yeah, and that because they breached their contract. Right. Well, there's um, a good business and, lesson. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh, how are you going to help them out with that? And they're like, well, they have to work it out. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's much it's, more like a business incubator here that are kind of linked to the universities, but it's started yeah. earlier that way. Yeah, so that's all the way through. From wow. that same thinking, that project-based experiences um, from early childhood all the way through with this foundation of we all value it. And when you move into society, like everyone's respected as an expert in their field. Right. Like if you're the chef at the burger place, you're an expert, you're a professional in that. Right. If you're a master's student, we respect that as well. So it's almost, it's, it's just a fundamental difference all the way down, right in the whole society in a way. Yeah. And I would invite anyone, like there's a trap in, in this conversation as well, because we can put it up on a pedestal mm -hmm. when the actual real learning is in, not if you're doing something right or if you're doing something wrong, is the reasoning behind you're doing these things. Okay. What, what's the intention behind it? What's the depth? What, what are the other factors that are playing part in them getting that outcome and them being where they're at. I think that's where the little gold pieces are in it, um, understanding their why. And I think that what I mentioned first around the light of the village concept mm -hmm. is that thing that's actually behind everything else. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, li little things as well, like going to the States and going to an amazing early childhood centre, and they've got all the health services in this centre. I'll go out to the playground, it's AstroTurf and a fort and beautiful park in the background. And um, I'm like, oh, cool, do you use a park? No. I was like, that's a sh not being completely insensitive. I just go, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was, yeah, but um, she's like, yeah, well, there's a number of shootings and there's stray pit bulls that get through the park and, yeah, so that's why we don't use it. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. That dry, that's one of those things behind your practices that if you don't look for it, um, you're going to miss out on the reasoning and the value they put on it because it has an influence. It's look at the, the – that's the ecosystem in which they're operating. Yeah, so you have that idea of you're not feeling safe as your starting point. Yes, 100%. So in relation to what you are mentioning about Canada and Australia being the same, you guys are actually, if you look at the data, better at being outdoors than we are. Right. Um, we've got some of the worst physical activity scores in the world. Really? And we're like the outdoor country and the outback yeah, yeah. and everything. Um, 126 countries, um, the UN physical research in teens, um, we rated at 120th. Wow. They de declared an emergency on the rate of physical activity in Australia for our children. The default think, of it's... What do you think's at the root of that? Like, I, I would... That would really surprise me. I have... I, I, I've traveled yeah. to Europe. I've, I've been to New Zealand. I've never been to Australia, but I've met a number of Australians, and this is a long time ago, but all very active. And maybe it's just the type I met because they're off traveling the world and they were bound to be more active, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, there's a small percentage of people that are active. It's a lot of organized sport mm -hmm. is the reliance on physical activity, which equates to just a few hours a week. Obviously, like the world situation around screens. Also, because we're a younger country that need we have a, had a lot of development in housing. The default for our infrastructure is to build suburbs. 
So you, so this, the suburbs have this, the children in the suburbs of Brisbane, this major city close to me, the children in the suburbs actually have less physical activity, although they have direct access to nature than children in the inner city, because the children in the inner city actually have functional activity. Right. So they're walk, walking to the bus, they're walking to the shops, they're walking to the park. The children in the suburbs, small blocks, 450 square metres, enough for like a pool, mm-hmm. that's it. And then when they leave the house, because of culture and I think unawareness to the importance of it, um, it's get in the car and go to the park, get, get in the car. Somewhere. and yeah. They're driven, driven everywhere. And, you know, we've gone from a kilometre of free play a generation ago to yep. line of sight. And that probably ties into so. parents being less likely to let their kids just run out the door and play. You know, it's, you yep. know, you're going to your friends, I'll, I'll take you there and make sure that their parents mm-hmm. are home and watching. There's less of just the kids meet in the street and, and do their thing than there was yep. a generation ago. Yeah. It's like, well, I prefer you to be on a screen here. and I know you're safe know you're safe than not unfortunately but then that's the things we're seeing is yeah the outcomes the teenagers struggling culture so you realize that all of this ties into so many things right from the physical health to the mental health to the future Mm. leaders that might be developed or not you know yeah and a lot of it so it's and just try to button this up a little bit and we'll, we'll let you get on you're probably was you're just starting your day i'm just ending my day what time are you at there? Yeah, it's it's not nine a.m. You're just ready to get up and raring to go. I'm 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 ready to wrap her up. So <laughs> ready to rock. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So it's that like at the root of it all. What's at the root of? I think I try to get to the root of it as this even a culture of fear and a culture of safetyism that comes down from the parents that comes down to the children that sort of result in a lot of things we're talking mm. about and i could be missing the mark i think that's part of it uh, you see it mm. as that or is there is there another piece as well to me those seem to be the big ones but i don't know for sure yeah i think it comes like you mentioned it earlier about what our parents and adults of the world are modeling to us to our children mm-hmm. and then we're becoming with that emotional contagion of that we are a culture of consumers not not producers and you know there's a default that we need to be entertained and it needs to be accessible all the time and that that instant gratification is where we go for our for our well-being for our safety for our refuge it's like oh let's the just birth get yeah absolutely and i think i think that is at the base of where the where we've progressed as a culture um we've we've really got to a stage now where we've there's such a disconnect between us as a contributor to, uh, to the ecology of our world where, where are we where are we in that you know all you have to do is ask a well, i'd play this, do this question with teachers and educators and say what's in the what's in the environment what's the major things in the environment and there are rocks and trees and sticks and they keep going and animals and animals and this and that and this and that and water rocks you go on and on and on and then right at the end once you go and then and what else and then and what else and then they go people we're so we're, separated we're, right we're so separated when we ask even that mental association of what is in nature you'll name everything out your window not yourself, yeah. And you don't even consider yourself as a part of it. We got to a place of we're independent of it, and we've got this <laughs> this this right and self righteousness to a certain extent of like, oh, we dictate everything. You and know? it's so foreign, you know. If our species is what are the latest latest thoughts? Somewhere around two hundred thousand years old, like in this current form, like same brain power, yeah. same body. If you dressed up someone from two hundred thousand years ago in your clothes and cleaned them up. It wouldn't see much difference. That's a massive amount of time, mm. a massive, massive amount yeah. of shared consciousness, shared experience, shared stories that we know nothing about mm. until maybe 5,000 years ago, right? And how long is the separation mm. from nature and the natural world and the idea that work, life is hard, that life is work? When did that mm. start? Yeah. 50, 50 years ago? Yeah. So we have, you know, nearly 200,000 years of life is challenging. We are part of nature. Life is yeah. hard. Life is work to just in the last 50 yeah. years that being gone. It's like, yeah, no wonder yeah. everyone's, uh, I'm going to swear about this, but no wonder everyone's getting a little fucked up. Like we, we yeah. short circuited 
nearly 200,000 years of hardwiring in our brains. Yeah. And when, what, just, look at, just look at the phone. Like I touched on it earlier, my job, I, was in the, I looked in the newspaper. That yeah. was not that long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a great book I'd recommend. It is called, it's Tom Hartman, and it's Surviving as a Hunter in the Farmer's World. It's in reference to neurodivergence in the realm of ADHD. So he's saying, Tom Hartman? Yeah, and yeah, surviving as a hunter in a farmer's world. And he's saying like ADHD and neurodivergence in that realm is not a disorder. It's remnants of being a hunter. Yeah, yeah. You know, you want, you, you want the alertness. You're yes. looking for little cues that distract you in the environment. You chase the things. You, you want to you eat the thing that wants to eat you. Yeah. And we talk about this hyper-focus that we both have. Yeah. Um, and we want, we, we gravitate towards risk because it brings us our focus Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he goes through the full history and you just have to look at how systematic Japan is one of the oldest agricultural cultures in the world and how it's like, let's get the field, right. We're going to put this system in place. We're going to do this and then this, and then this, and then we're going to get an outcome. That's an agricultural mindset and, and it, traditional education is the agricultural, agricultural model. So there's this huge discrepancy between the hunter and fitting the system of the agricultural model. I love it. So it's, it's an amazing read. Um, I'd recommend that one for anyone. There's, there's well. a similar book. And a line you've mentioned. Um, sorry, go on. Yeah. It's a similar book. I can't think of the author's name. I have a copy. I've read it once or twice. It's not called Drive, not by Daniel Pink. It's called Driven. And it's a relatively small book that doesn't have a lot of coverage or traction. And he's a psychologist and a therapist who wrote the book. And he talks very much about that same idea. And the idea is people who are driven are, it's that hunter versus farmer idea. Mm. And whether it's that entrepreneurial mindset, that extreme sports person, like the ones who need, you know, always looking for what's moving in the bushes. And you're, you, you're never still because you're the one yeah. there. You're not the one at the back of the crowd tending things. You're the one out leading the charge, looking for the risk because, and it, yeah. and then he, he goes into a little bit about the, the problems when it, that, that desire isn't uh, satiated, you know, and how it can lead to people taking extremely risky behaviors, or if you don't find a healthy way to mm. embrace it, it leading to uh, substance abuse and everything else. Right. Because you walk in sort of this razor's edge, yep. right? but I've never heard it linked necessarily mm, to definitely. ADHD, which makes a whole lot of sense too. Yeah. He um, he released a book a fair while ago and he absolutely got caned for it. They're like, you can't say that. And now it's being like completely acknowledged as like, oh. Wait okay. a second. You yeah. Might, you might have been, you might have been right. Yeah. Like, might have. And they're like, you're right. <laughs> um. We don't take back another what we book. Said. Yeah, another book we mentioned offline for your listeners is Steve Rinella's new book. Yes, Outdoor Kids and Inside World. Get into that, and if you're up for a challenging read, for me anyway, is um, The Road Less Traveled. I think it was he wrote it in the seventies, but the opening line is "Life is hard, and the sooner we come to terms with life is hard, it will become a, a slightly easier." Yeah, absolutely right. Life is suffering. Yeah. This is ancient. This is ancient wisdom. Yeah. Right? It's just having to be Absolutely. reframed in ways that we can understand now and put to use now, right? Like life is suffering. Yeah. Is that call. So, and I'll, I'll yeah. leave it on, on this note. I had a couple little notes here. The idea that uh, going back to how old uh, our species is and some of these most ancient stories, this sort of ties into that idea too, right? And most of our ancient stories that we look up to and revere are stories of call to adventure call to adventure yeah. and hardship and resilience those are the things we've always aspired to mm. it's why we still watch uh, every damn marvel movie that comes out you know there's, it's yeah. nothing new but it's the call to adventure and going put persevering yeah. through hardship right so yeah the hero's journey exactly so keep up yeah. the good fight thanks for doing everything uh, you do and thanks for you chatting and with me supporting here. mate awesome and i love hearing people all over the world and and what you're doing there to Get your boys outside and get them on their own hero's journey. Yes. It's, it's awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. I'll uh, Thanks so much, hopefully man. catch up with you again, and we'll put links here for everyone to find everything you're doing and follow you online and wherever it is you may go. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Thanks a bunch.
Have a great day. Take care. Chat soon. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Raise Them Rugged podcast. We'll see you again next time as we continue on this parenting journey. Be sure to like, subscribe, download, and rate the show. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media outlets.